welcome, welcome, welcome. Team, we've got to January 2024, and you've found Book Lovers Wire Wrapper. I'm Gareth Rapson. I'm with co-host Steve Lawrence. Hello, Gareth. And this is your one-hour program about the wonderful world of books. You've found us on 92.7 Arrow FM and Channel 41 on Wire Rapper's Freeview TV. As always... Steve, our city councillor, sponsor, owner of Elmo's. What's happening with the Y word scene? Well, I, I, firstly, I do, as usual, have to thank you for the Carterton's promotion to the city status because That's what we do. most other people don't think we quite qualify. But, you know, we punch above our weight, of course, but, you know, it's quite a big step up. Um, what did you ask me? Something I'm asking you about because I've. Peter Stevenson, the storyteller. Yes. So the first Y word for 2024, I'm still getting used to writing that down, um, is on the 24th of February, which is a Saturday uh, in the afternoon, and that will be in the Carterton Courthouse, which is my personal favourite venue that we use. Right. Because um, it's just kind of nice sort of warm... Well, it's a courtroom, so I don't suppose it's booky, but it seems to suit. It's small and intimate and looks yeah. fabulous. Yeah, we can get 80 people in. It's a bit of a squish, but you can. I do think sometimes you'd be very happy to get 80 in, and other times it just would be not big enough. Mm. Yeah, um, it's cosy at 80, but... Uh, Cosy's mm. good. Mm. And it's probably but it doesn't look ridiculous at 30, you know. And would you'd be better for voice projections and things like that it's quite good yeah mm. yeah the fact that we sometimes can't work the audio visual stuff doesn't seem to matter <laughs> and, and peter stephen tells stories yes he's welsh uh he's um living in new zealand uh he's written a couple of collections of, of welsh fairy stories and folk stories and things he's also written a number of kids books and he's an illustrator as well so he's a clever guy um and he's but he's he's going to be telling stories so it's that's his being lost does he sing almost certainly if he can draw he can sing surely he can do he's the whole package yeah i haven't actually asked him that but and yeah. to foreshadow march what <sighs> you should have asked me that before and i would have i think we're doing could be wrong it might be april uh a, a session on there's a word for it, sort of memorialising, helping people write down their life stories. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Oral histories and yeah. yeah. That that's there's there's a lot of people interested in that these days, mm. and oh, that'll be fun. Anyway, yeah. that's foreshadowing it. Yeah. Now I've got a question for you. Now, I, I've got this is the one where I'm, my job is to remind you at the end of the show. Exactly. I, you, I, I frame up the question and you think about it, yeah. and then we have the big reveal at the end, and it's got. Which books or writers have had the most adaptations to movies? So the writers of whose works have most movies been made of. So I want you to dwell on that one, and our listeners can dwell on that one, and there'll be the big reveal at about 4.25. So is it a correct answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, just, I, this popped up, and so I've yeah. got a list of a range of writers and how many yeah. and I'm just keen to see you'll be throwing some names at me and um, because you are the, the book guru in the room and well. I expect you to have thought and you'll you'll I'm sure you'll have some very good answers for us how did Christmas go for Elmo's oh pretty good um, I've been telling people for all of 2023 that I thought it was going to be challenging for retail and it has been statistically um, I mean, if you look at the profit figures for the warehouse, for Briscoe's, for nobody's making much money in, in retail these days. Um, but yeah, December was, was, was good for us. And if I had to say, like, what was the best couple of books for you? Um, In terms of, of numbers that we sold, prob probably, and it's just every year it's the same with the Jack Reacher. Was, was it? Can't remember. The, the Secret? Up, the Secret, I think, yeah, which is, so that's the um, 
so Lee, that's, Lee Child and, and his brother. So that's mm -hmm. under the Christmas tree for a lot of people. Yeah. And the Day of the Locust went well. We've talked about that yeah. a fair bit. Um, so that thrillers. Um, no, that's we're actually in that yeah, area of thrillers. Yeah, yeah. non-fiction. Any any book raced off? Uh, Top Twins was good. Um, Excellent. Have a yeah. Kiwi book there. Yeah. Um, I just like the fact that a lot of citizens of the of the valley get a book. It's a very good sign. Mm. You know. Um, anyway, all right. We'll. But let's put 2023 away now. We're, we're looking forward in a more expansive way to um, a lot and, and high expectations for a great year for books. Well, I think so. Um, I do. It's still, you know, let's be careful out there sort of country. But I think, I think things will generally be a bit better. I think the farmers are not probably quite as worried as they were. Um, yeah, we can't have those worried farmers. They, they, they pick. Well, we can't because they don't spend any money. And despite <laughs> what, all the wonderful variety of economic activity that goes on in the Warrapa, it's still a farming yeah. area. And, you know, if the farmers aren't buying new tractors and TFM aren't servicing them and the mechanics have got shorter, you know, it all just it ripples. trickles down, yeah. Yeah. I want to start the new year with looking at a music book and then I'll ask you to say your music book over there because I when we know you've got one or two mm. um, and this book Scattershot the life music Elton and me um, Bernie Torpin um, saw it getting reviewed mm. and I've always kind of we had Elton's story was it me was it was it called me Pretty sure it was. You might be right. I, didn't, it's, I mean, that's yeah. the sort of thing Elton would call his book. Um, <laughs> and we sort of got, Bernie was kind of mentioned, but it was all about Elton. Hmm. And um, and Bernie's kind of like notoriously private in a lot of ways. And so, and nobody really knew too much. But then he penned this, hmm. which is really very, very, very good. Um, we all know him from um, his... Being the other half of one of the great musical partnerships, um, and we did get a little look of him, kind of like a, an imaginary him in was it Rocket Man the movie? Yeah, yeah. Um, and countless hits, millions of records, um, very very wealthy from writing the lyrics. I mean, he's the word guy, and he spent all his life. He spent he's still with us, writing, 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 reading, reading, reading. Mm. Absolutely, as it comes from here. This guy is a reader. He hits the box for all his ideas, hmm. and he's constantly capturing them and building them into little stories. And and every now and then, one of them goes into galactic, and um, the magic would happen. Because the, the way they did it, they, I think they're still doing it. I'm not sure about that, but he he'd write a song, write some lyrics, give them to Elton. And completely independently, he writes the music. Yeah, and then they'd, you know, yeah, and they never, according to this, they never argued or anything. It was mm. always like, and it, and it didn't matter because the song, the, the lyrics kept coming. Mm. And every now and then, and, and that was, I guess, the genius of Elton John was his ability to take the words and suddenly hit chords and suddenly create some magic out yeah. of it. Yeah. Because I guess not every set of lyrics would spark something, but no. Well, it's like painting yeah. or any sort of creative endeavour. Most of it doesn't work, yeah. <laughs> so you keep working at it, and every now and then, it happens. Mm. Um, anyway, it's, it was how it happened and how it worked is tucked away in here. But it's not your kind of normal. It's a fun ride, mm. whirlwind sort of um, approach. It's not chronological. It t takes a theme and sort of it discusses that um we get a really good look at early 70s new york which is always kind of fun la life hanging out with you know bob marley and john lennon he meets an elderly frank sinatra mm. um he has a and he, and he turned to art became an artist installation art and did really well with that later in life um very in, in, you know 
very inspired by Dali and Warhol and things like that. And he writes about, really interestingly, about art. So this book is not all actually about, about him and Elton. It's about Bernie, because strange things like he loved writing. He was, here's a boy out of a little county in the UK, but loved cowboys and all that. So he became a rodeo rider <laughs> and competed, you know, in rodeos and lived that rodeo world with horses and all that, because nobody knows that, you know, <laughs> oh, and, and if you don't read the book, you yeah. know, it kind of like, it became, you know, there it is. Um, but he's, he liked hanging out with kind of, he's an incredibly curious guy, you know, he, in the sense of being curious about the strange people out there, the misfits, the eccentrics, the sort of mavericks, you know, and also in that whole, which a lot of music attra the industry attracts a lot of those sort of people. And he was very comfortable hanging around in it. Um, it's, he's very perceptive. And because he's a lyricist, the writing is kind of top shelf. Mm. I mean, he thinks about word. Yeah, East Midlands um, childhood, um, going from that into the fishbowl life of Beverly Hills, because he, be he lived basically his life in America uh, once they made it. Um, lots of adventures, lots of mishaps. I've mentioned his love of books. Um, lots of anecdotes about anything but music. Um, his, his relationships and marriages are all tucked away in here. But being a private guy, he, kind of, the, the, he always comes across as a kind, humble, good guy. And, um, and I think it's kind of written, written with a poet's voice. So for, what I'm saying really is for, for readers of in the music genre, um, this is a goodie. Hmm. Now, you, we have at Elmo's music box. Yes, we do. You know, and how do they move? Uh, the rock biographies in particular do pretty well. So there are the people who like the music, and particularly some of the rock people who are now a bit older, um, they just like to read about how it happened. I um, guess it takes them back to their childhoods. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you, you, you know, you look for these books for the the rock stories. Yeah. And like Cornhole, you're familiar with that game, you know, where they, they you show, there's, it's an American game where mm. there's a, a platform, but, you know, and you throw a little bag. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what it's called. So that, his, yeah. and Elton's version of this is they go around collecting all the glass ashtrays and then they have all the rubbish and, and dumpsters down below them, 17 floors below, and they play cornhole out of hotels. That was all, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's the sort of rock and roll tales, you know, you're kind yeah. of like... Well, that's relatively mild compared yeah, yeah. to... Yeah, well, well, yeah, <laughs> as it goes. And um, anyway, highly recommended. You, your music book you got over there? Well, what I thought I'd do this month, I just picked up a few recent bits of non-fiction, um, and it happens that we've had two Beatles-themed books in the last month or two. One is The Reluctant Beatle, George Harrison. So w there's lots of stuff written about the Beatles. We haven't had a George Harrison biography for quite a while. How did you rate him in the... The four Beatles. Well, I don't know. That's a bit like you know, which is your favourite child, isn't it? Well, we, we, no, they, did they die in the right order, or are they dying in the right order? Because that's what I've heard that people some they're dying in the wrong order. <laughs> well, I don't suppose they got any choice. No, no, they have no choice when assassins are taking you a, out. That's but, a but, kind of a stupid thing to say. Yeah, no, but <laughs> well, it's kind of like the super talented one mm. being John mm. um, being you know tragically shot and um, then they go like the super interesting one i.e. George mm. um, then dies and you know leaving Paul who's another super talented well, guy but and then Ringo the drummer living hanging around in LA yeah but Ringo is you know a, a, a worthwhile individual I'm sure he's a fabulous guy um, but I really got to admire Paul McCartney because despite the fact he's probably the second most famous person in the world after Donald, Donald Trump and must have enormous amounts of money, he always seems like such a normal sort of a person when he's 
It sounds like he talked to anyone. Yeah, no, yeah, he, he sounds like the the good guy. You know? Yeah, you don't hear many no bad stories about. No, but George, I mean, actually, he's a bit of a mystery to me, and that book's going to clarify a bit of that. Yeah, so that's what I call it the reluctant Beetle. He clearly wasn't as keen on the limelight as the others. Right. Um, probably more more interested in the music and the themes, without getting the big sign songwriting credits it'd be so. hard to kind of get in amongst two kind of heavy weights you know lennon and mccartney to get your stuff in hmm. and the direction that you, the band was going to go because you know when you watch all that those sort of tapes and peter jackson things yeah. that, that he was he was the one who was often not happy and not turning up yeah. and yeah. but i mean they weren't they weren't the band for very long really were they um, I was listening to um, News Talk ZB in the morning. It might have been yesterday, and the the lead singer from Simple Minds was on. They're still touring and have been since 1969. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> still producing new albums. Um, well, you know, I always think 69. Well, that's only you know like 10 years, but actually, it's well over 50. Yeah. <laughs> I, the biggest source I like is, is kind of the fact of that they they, they start off as a young band and then, you know, moon playing all the time in Germany and all, mm. that, and all that. And when their first um, number one came out, you know, Love Me Do or whatever yeah. it was, they had had 1,500 gigs. Yeah. They, they weren't the overnight thing. And they were like tight ass. They'd absolutely sharpened their, mm. their act right down. And had all these, you know, kind of hits that were going to roll off because they'd worked at it for so long. Um, anyway, for, how, so that's I'm not seeing the photos sort of section in that box. Oh, yeah, no, there is a few there. Yeah, yeah quite a few. Quite a few. You haven't found any. Oh, there we go. Yeah, right. Yeah, they put them in, and in the big paperbacks they put them in bunches because it's cheaper to do it that way. <laughs> all right, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So you get where would you rate that on the star system? Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to do that. Give me, <laughs> ask me on stupid questions. It must be January. We're all coming off holidays. We're all rested. Yeah. What else? No, look, Paul McCartney's. So at the same time, we have Paul McCartney, the lyrics. Now I'm not a hundred percent clear if he's actually written this, but it's so. What it is? It's a big book. Oh, a lot of songs. A lot of songs. A lot of pictures in this one. They're done differently because they're set in the pages, which means that the quality isn't as good, but a lot more of them. There's two ways to do it. You can either have plates inserted, and then you get photographic quality, or you, you know, you get the... So what you have here is the words of yeah. every Beatles song and a little story about what it was. So it's not just the lyrics that... Paul wrote. It's like the band wrote. Yeah. I'd yeah. So the co-credits and all that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because often, after a while, they, they actually kind of you know, said it came from the group, hmm. uh, which is always a problem. Who's going to get the extra rights? But anyway, or, go. Or the yep. extra money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So for, for, I think it's odd that they've come out together, but for people who are interested in the Beatles, and there's still a lot, um, you know, we play a bit of music in the shop, and... Um, it, probably in a reaction to a month of carols. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to uh, speak to you about that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've been doing the best of the Beatles. Um, and It's a happy vibe. Yeah, and it's it, it, you wouldn't know that they were, you know, 50 years old, those songs, that they yeah. no, they're no, fine. No, they're... And, and I, I think we're probably getting another generation of, of well, second, maybe third Come generation. On, my grandchildren, kids, yeah, grandchildren like them. Yeah, who hear these songs on the radio think, that's great. Oh, mm. is that older than you, Granddad? <laughs> that's right, yeah. Oh, no, no, we won't go to there. <laughs> yeah, so there's, um, yeah, I just thought it was slightly coincidental. We've got a couple of, I think, good quality, interesting Beatles-related books in the last few weeks. Yeah. Here's a little book that came across my desk, Remember Me. By edited by Anne Kennedy, and it's Poems to Learn by Heart from Aotearoa. Um, 
cool little volume. So who published that? Published by, and I, well published by the way, Auckland University Press. Oh. And, um, I get this stuff, I wonder why I didn't buy that. It's a, it's, I'm probably it's a bit grumpy really that day. good. It, yeah. it is, um, the, it's a nice range of all our poets. Um, when was it? When was when did it come out? You can tell uh, from it's page so like, two or three. I think. No, I'm gonna like it's gonna like came out yesterday. I reckon, 2023. Oh, okay. Creative New Zealand helped them get it out. Um, ghost, you know, they're they're, they're themed up into um, wisdom, odes, earth, sea, and sky, love songs, far now, history stories. Politics, and it ends with how to memorize and recite a poem. Quite nice. Um, plenty of air in it. You know, not lots of nice space. Um, You've got one to read. You said I did. I did have a little poem by because we did our. We were going to do a poem. We thing, were. But forget, sort of, but we, yeah. we should leave this book on the table. You know, um, Brian Turner, yep. our our voice from the south. A little poem called Sky. If the sky knew half of what we're doing down here, it would be stricken, inconsolable, and we would have nothing but rain. <laughs> I thought, Brian, you're onto it there, mate. Um, I, I really like this. Really mm. rate it as a, as a little, you know, neat little... Um, yeah, and it's kind of like uh, terrific for an English department because... Um, often, you know, asking students to memorise a poem as, a, as an exercise in uh, a, working mm. on your memory skills um, and then their recitation skills is a small little part of English. And often the, the curious things about what we learnt when we were at school somehow stick with us. Um, we, we can all probably remember fragments of poems we were taught. Um, and, of course, they were all English print poems, but these days... You know, there's a terrific canon of, of New Zealand work. Talking about reciting poems, John Ansel, have you come across John? Yes. yes. How do I know that name? What? Oh, he's an interesting guy. He was um, worked in advertising for a long time. A um, little bit right-wing. Um, <laughs> but he, he's um, he came along to a, a little function we had one day and, and recited from memory this long, long, long poem called Spot of the Arctic, which was about who got to the North Pole first. And we all know, I think it's Roald Amundsen, yes. but his theory was, clearly it wasn't, it was Spot, who was the lead dog. And <laughs> what he, little mark he made when he got to the pole. <laughs> so, sorry. Well, go, hey, look, we're becoming more species conscious, you see, <laughs> so I, I absolutely identify with that. Mm. But speaking to that, the, there are people who, you, you know, suddenly, you know, with a few wines in them at a party can suddenly start disclaiming and be totally entertaining. <laughs> um, and, of course, performance poetry, you know, Chris Teese and those, who I believe was a Y word. Yes, yes. Because that's where you introduced yeah, me to him. Yeah. Um, they were fantastically talented at it and, mm. and terrifically interested. So it's a whole kind of like art form um, of performance poetry. This thing is full of little memorable ones. And I photocopied one of those books. I'm not sure what the ethics of photocopying those things, but for things saying, I like that poem. You know, I would like to have that around. Because um, when, the, you know, like if your book club gets into discussing poetry or little poetry groups, that was my go-to. Mm. Moving on. Here's the cover. What do you think? Well, it's a good cover. Um, the eyes seem to follow you around the room. <laughs> yellow face. Now, it says here, yellow face. Um, the practice of wearing makeup to imitate an East Asian person. This practice is generally regarded as offensive. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Rebecca Quang, who wrote a book, I think, about Babel, was it? Babel. Yeah, I think. And I think, like, both publish, like, yeah. pretty close to each other. Mm. And Babel looks really good. Um, I haven't read it, but I have got this one. And you will notice it's got our little book club thing, and it is book club in a bag. And um, our book club are doing this in February. So that's why it's on my, on my desk. Nice and slim. Um, 
It's about the right size for a book, really, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, Some no. of them get a bit fat. This is one hell of a story. It's just not hers to tell. And it's, it's, it's kind of like the idea of stealing somebody else's work, which is a, an old trope. We, it's, mm. it's kind of um, been done before with art and with literature and all that sort of stuff. But this one here actually gets totally into the world of publishing, which, as you, Steve, you know a lot about that. So I'm thinking this is a book for you. It's also appearing on all, you know, Unity's bestsellers and book, Barnes and Noble mm. and all the sort of publishers in America and people who put out book lists. It, there it is. So it's it's in the wind as mm. as a as a book and that's kept, you know got some notice. Um, it's a story of Athena Lou and June Hayward. Um, Athena, who's a great mate, they're great friends dies and Jane June steals her her manuscript and the consequences of what happens from it. Um, smart modern novel, bigger issues are social media and um, how weird that can be and a lot of you know reverse racism you know with from these Asians in here mm. you know like all whites kind of look the same you know, all that sort of <laughs> stuff. A little bit of like, like labels that made me, I just jotted this down, a little sidebar in the story, but it's kind of like in our census, we have in New Zealand, you know, like European Pakeha, Maori, you know, um, Jedi Knight, Pacifica or Pacific, Asian, you know, Jedi, that we have yeah. all those. And in the American census, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, so but that they do the black white you know thing, mm. and it, this book gets into a little bit of that thing, like what's going on here the way we describe people, um, first person writer so that you know it's got that immediacy about it, clever. Um, how do you justify to yourself a crime, and that's that sort of is beautifully handled on it, the um, the the absolute absolute brutality of the publishing industry and how man, how it manipulates a the writer and the audience by the way it uses publicity and selects and whatever it is um, it's a satire and it's mocking the process of book of of novels and or the book publishing world um, how arbitrary it is Anyway, you get the mental stress of someone based on plagiarism mm. as, as June attempts to handle this worldwide success and then suddenly the doubters through social media going, hey, this doesn't kind of, this sounds more like Lou's work, not, you know, mm. and, you know, it's sort of... Um, so you get the moral decisions of doing the deed. Um, you get how we delude ourselves committing crimes, um, the excitement of fame, you know, it's it's totally addictive, the siren song of it and how everybody, it's about jealousy and envy, friendships, how friendships flame and die that we have, um, that's all sort of um, the desire to live a creative life um, and the, you know, who owns ideas, are they up for grabs, because when she takes the book she actually reworks it in her own sort of way. Um, Anyway, it's all about X, X, tw is that, that's X, how we call Twitter. Twitter, yeah, yeah. and Facebook and Instagram, the, the kind of echo chamber on what a strange kind of rabbit hole it is to go down. And in this book, we go down it in a really funny way. Mm. So if you like satire, Yellow Face is a, is a novel for you. Okay, let's have a change of pace and perhaps do a little non-fiction. Well, I thought before we did that, I would just draw people's attention to this little book which I don't know if the thing is ever going to turn around but it might eventually this book is called Spare Us because we did have Spare at the beginning of last year which we um, oh, that was the best piece of purchasing I ever did I needed I knew it would a lot of people would want to read it but I didn't think it would be much good. I didn't think it would have legs, but I had to buy a lot to get it on the release date. So I discounted it as much as I could and I got rid of everything I got and I couldn't have sold another one, I don't think. <laughs> that's, so that's a bit of a punt. 
you're, you're really rolling the dice. Well, you have to. Thinking, what's, what's going to... Yeah. But it was, it was just everywhere. Mm. I mean, everyone was talking about it. Mm. So this is called Spare Us. So this is a, the cover is a picture of Harry with a couple of bits of sticking plaster over his mouth. So we're picking up the satire take on Yellow Face yeah. and continuing it. And it's called a Harrody. And I just thought it'd give you a sense <laughs> of it. <laughs> oh, I just so is this, this book a whole book Pun City or is it just No, no, it's just it's written in the same style as Spare. Oh yeah. Okay, which I haven't read. No, well don't. Um this says, chapter 38, My mates had somehow talked me into going to Vegas. I didn't fancy it at all. Spending all that time in giant, ludicrously expensive and gaudy palaces filled with a name chatter and wasted money. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I'm into that sort of... That's that. What would someone come into the shop and see Harry on it and think, oh, yeah, that's the book. I've heard about it. Spare. Yeah, I, uh, did you, did I've had to stop a couple of people buying it when I realised what they went, wanted it for. Did anyone buy both? No. no. Oh, they came out at different times, I take it. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is relatively recent, probably three or four months or something. See, and, and I also have a theory that humour books are best done slimmer. It's, a, it's, a, it's an art, and you don't need... It's kind of tricky enough to get right, let mm. alone... You know, fill it so that that look. That, I love a, a thin book by yeah. that. Yeah, and it, this is it's just a little collectible, I reckon. You know, in thirty years' time, if you've still got this on your bookshelf, you'll be able to explain to people. Yeah, you'll be able to yeah. on you know on trade me. People will just go nuts going yeah, <laughs> for it. What was going on at the time? So that's just for fun. Okay, no, it's it's, <coughs> it's good to have. I, I know actually. I noticed in the bookshop Steve, mm. there is. Quite a few books like this, a, mm. you know, a little humour niche box. Yeah. Is that just you? Uh, um, well, I put, I tend to concentrate them around the cafe. Right. Because people often have, you know, a couple of minutes while they're waiting for their toasted sandwich or whatever, just to so glance at something. And they're there, by the, do they, they take them to the table and... Um, no, people just... Just kind of browse them. Uh, often people say, "Well, you know, aren't you worried about the books and?" Things? Well, it's the toasted sandwich marks on it, you know. Yeah, but uh, uh, munching it, you know, eating it, and you, so. No, I'd I've never, seen bookshops that don't mind that totally, you know. Yeah, I, it's never been a problem. Okay, I think it, that they're respectful and careful. Well, my overall approach to life, which will get me, gets me into a lot of trouble every now and then, is. If you kind of trust people, they sort of generally behave okay. It's when people think that you don't trust them that they behave in an untrustworthy way. Steve, that's why people watch these shows <laughs> or listen to us. It's, the, it's, the, it's Steve's philosophical take on life and a little gem there, a little bit of wisdom. Yeah. yeah. Um, well done. And the odd little thing that goes amiss, well, I think you've, you get repaid with your faith in human nature most of the time, so anyway, that's just how I think. So, this is the karmic life of Steve that we're hearing about here. Perhaps we could just um, jump and go off off planet there in the book you're holding there. Well, I've got a couple of books here, uh, which are sort of small coffee table books, I guess. So, this is Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's written, who's a He's kind of a popular scientist, but also a proper scientist. He's, he's, so he's a, a cosmologist. He's a bit of a YouTube whiz and TED Talks and all that stuff, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, he's on telly a lot with kids. Right. Um, trying to get them interested in the cosmos. Is that why I like the books? Anyway, go on. Have a... No, I'm sure you're quite grown <laughs> up really good. Anyway, it's time you started to be. That's right. Um, and I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress, I've been told. <laughs> so you're talking about illustrations. This is a richly illustrated, colourful pictures on actually every page about most things to do with yeah, it's just like the universe, out, and the universe and solar system the solar yeah. system yeah this I mean without you know the world sending rockets out there all that sort of stuff now we, we are looking at the stars that's this is the time and oh. so this the, that resonates with a book like that um, people are curious it's a really hard case what you can do. I mean, the, Jap the Japanese have just sent a, something that land on the moon, um, which they forgot to 
plug in or something. So it's <laughs> that's right. That, that, that little power issue because I, you know, you think if anyone's going to get the battery stuff right, you know, little cool gadgets, it's going to be. But the, but they've got these little rover things, which are the coolest thing you've ever seen. Is it one that of, flips? Yeah, it jumps. So oh, no. it, it rolls along the moon surface, comes to a rock, rather than just go around it, which you'd think it could do, it jumps over it. It's a oh. really hard case looking thing. Yeah, no, I, I saw that on TV and I was yeah. going like that. That is that is a cool Japanese thing that you know and also there'll probably be a toy out now that kind of mimics that that'll pay for the whole expedition. But yeah. uh, and you're right, people are, uh, whether they think we're so close to completely making this planet uninhabitable that it's time to start looking around for another one, or... Um, no, uh, what? But, there's no doubt... It's the sort of book I actually would think you would also find a teenage audience for, you know, people curious about it. And also, it's, it seems to be an evolving... Perhaps there's a job in this kind of industry, even in New Zealand. Um, oh, yeah. With, with tech that goes with it. Um, yeah. So, uh, that, that's... I've made a note of that. It's the sort yeah. of book I, I'm... Well, it's, a, it's a little bit expensive. It's 65 bucks hardback. But it has got, you know, we're told before, that every time you put a picture in a book, it costs a hell of a lot more money. And there's... This but good. but no, see, I, no, Steve, I'm I'm a visual reader. Hmm. I'm I like I like pictures. Hmm. Always have, and so the more pictures, the more inter- uh, the more I'm likely to pick it up. So, in fact, I just like to have all pictures and just you know a little minimum bit of text, hmm. like a graphic novel and all that stuff, which I'm really fond of. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, we've got the Milky Way Kiwi people in Carterton. Um and what their objective is to be science educators. So what they've got is inflatable planetarium that they pack up and take around to schools. And so what they're trying to do is create a workforce for a space-based industry here in New Zealand because they think there are infinite numbers of jobs in it, and it's a, just their mission. And of course we. Harry used to work for NASA and for the Carter Observatory and stuff, but you know. and, and our our dark sky, our Stonehenge, yeah, our valley's cool at the stuff. Yeah. We're, we're good star watchers and lookers at the sky. Yeah. Therefore, everybody should go to infinity and beyond. To wasn't infinity, that, a, wasn't that a, long, a line from Toy Story? Absolutely, Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, who could forget that? I mean, I don't know if he had to ring up whoever it was. And ask nicely if he could use it, and they would probably say, "For you, Neil, anything." <laughs> but, well, I, I always think, wasn't it? Wasn't it? A, was it a catchphrase from S- Star Trek, and then picked up by Buzz, or was Buzz where it was the Pixar people created it? I think the Pixar people created it. They're clever guys. The what was Star Trek? That was to I mean, no man has gone before, or yeah. something. Yeah, you're good at all this. This sort of, you know. <sighs> Um, sort of, I'm I, just I going to call it like media culture. You've always seemed to got. Yeah, got but it has, to be, oh, got it, a, it has to be a long time ago. <laughs> I always do, sometimes when things are a bit quiet, I do those little quizzes that they suck you into, so you, you have to click on things, and it says, you know, if you can get 19 out of 20 of these, you're some sort of historical genius or TV junkie or something. Right. I normally get most of them as long as, as long as it happened before about 1968. Yeah. I'm in good shape. You don't do these quizzes when you're at the council table, do you know, when somebody's giving some long presentation, you just, oh, there's Steve, look. You know, Let's actually. just keep our little secrets. <laughs> <laughs> doppelgangers. What's a doppelganger? A doppelganger, I think, is it's German word for someone who looks like you, doesn't it? German word? Hmm. Meaning, I love this, a double walker. Oh, okay, doppelganger. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... Doppelganger, a trip into the mirror world, which just has to be a great tag line because immediately go like the mirror world, oh yeah, social media, all that sort of stuff. Um, Naomi Klein. Mm. Now, Naomi, important public intellectual. Yes. No logo. Um, I've got down here shock doctrine. Yeah. Um, Something about burning. This changes it. Yeah, there's a burning one. This changes everything. Yeah. She is, you know, an absolute um, activist and speaker for climate change and um, social justice. Social justice and anti 
mega corporations mm. um, and the damage they do to the whole scene. Um, now, this book is about the fact that Naomi Klein is often now confused. She has a doppelganger, Naomi Wolf. <laughs> now, Naomi Wolf is a kind of right-wing chancer who is into conspiracy therapy theories and, um, you know, is a regular on Fox News um, talking with Tucker Castle Coulson and um, an absolute Trump um, supporter and a, the polar opposite, Naomi's. <laughs> and Naomi Klein is starting to find that people think that's her <laughs> because this other person has a huge public... Um, profile, and and she's like, she's like justifiably, justifiably a little ticked off. Um, anyway, this Naomi is so. This is it's how it's a how it's getting into how the world is blurring a lot of fact, and, um, and she and Naomi's arguing. I'm caught up in this. Um, and it's kind of like what is genuine and what is specious is now contested. Um, and it's, she, you know, and it, so this book is about, look, I guess you've, I've got it down here, so the psychic landscape of people who are caught up in this, um, how our thinking is shaped by big tech and um, sort of big sort of big pharmac, uh, all sorts of things. So it's a mixture of reportage, memoir, and analysis. Now, if you like public international, in, uh, public intellectuals like this, which I do, mm -hmm. I think they've got things to say, and, um, and she's been the poster child for, you know, work on climate for a long time, and um, a lot of other things. This is a really good book, really good read and a really good insight into social media. However, I did think, it's the sort of thing if I'd read it in a North-South magazine, you know, like four or five pages, I think I would have got it. Yeah. Um, or, it's, uh, you know, it's... But if you're a fan of Klein, go for it. You know, it's, um, you know, it's very, very interesting. And um, I think more people are fond of or fans of her thoughts than of her, if you like, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. But when they start getting confused with, you know, an absolute... I can understand why she's annoyed by that, but... Yeah. yeah and, I'm a bit like, I don't, I don't really see a whole book in it. <laughs> no, but, but I think, because I've read the others and been mm. interested in it, mm. I found it a, a good read all the way through, because mm. I, I, I think these sort of people are kind of interesting. They could write about anything, and it's kind of thoughtful and interesting. Mm. Um, that's what makes them, you know, they've got out into a public profile. Uh, it's just that when there's an absolute dire nutcase, I mean, maybe that's the wrong word, I'm being a bit harsh here. Yeah, I think, yeah. Wolf is, you know, an extremist for conspiracy theories, um, and is putting them out and is involved with them, you know, you could feel it just the annoyance <laughs> radiates out of it. Anyway, many thanks for that. You can find that book on, in Elmo's nonfiction section. Mm. Though Steve took a little few minutes to find it for me. <laughs> the, no, uh, Rosalie found it. Let's go. How about the natural world? Just leave that sort of social world, social media world, and what have we got? Um, okay, so this is. And I think this is based on another one of the TV series. So this is The Life of Birds, David Attenborough. Um, uh, most of these books he's done based on his BBC series are great big things with concomitant. Is that a word? Um, That's a great word. <laughs> Listen yeah. to this program to work on your vocabulary. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, prices accordingly. Um, but this is this is just a trade paperback. But again... It's got a lot of illustrations, so price-wise, it's somewhere in the middle. It's a little over forty dollars. Kiwi. Uh, I think there's some. I don't mean you know, like keep the bird. No, yeah. I mean <laughs> I know what you mean. Index of birds. Uh, I, think so. I think I thought so. Where are we? Uh, walk. 
here on HIJK. A lot of birds. There are a lot Kiwi, of Kiwi. Twenty eight to thirty two hundred and four. No, no, I meant like, is it a New Zealand book? No, of course it's not. It's British. But so, well, a, David Attenborough, he's a citizen of the world. Surely. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I, I missed that. Yeah, wasn't. I was concentrating over here on something else. The. Um, uh, where's it gone? Nature books. I've got. I'm. I've got some nature books on my radar that I'm. You know, I'm gonna. I'm sure I'm gonna talk later in the year about um, the reasons why I should buy this. Oh, it's just if you're interested in birds. A lot of people are. A lot of people are. But the, the birds we're not going to see. These are birds... Oh, you oh. mean like, and here's the flamingo. No, it's about how they evolved and what, how they live and what they do. And, he's, and then there are a whole bunch of pictures of them. And he's... He is one authoritative. of the wonders of the world. Well, he's certainly, you know... Oh, there's he's, a kiwi. Here you go. Um, I mean, and, and there's a kakapo. I mean, mm -hmm. any story about environmentalism is going to be yeah and it's one of it's got one of those voices that you know almost anybody can can <laughs> do an impression <laughs> no uh, yeah you're right slightly breathless <laughs> oh and, and, and slightly Wildly engaging excited, yeah, too yeah so people do the david attenborough treatment of someone going out to collect the milk and right, yeah <laughs> no, no, it's it's um yeah brings to mind michael palin another great voice the um no, oh, okay, that's... So, I, yeah, I, I feel like... You've got a little book, a bird section. We've got a lot of books about birds, and we only do that because we sell them. Yeah. Yeah. That seems your, your smart business model is buy books that people want. It's not by any means infallible, otherwise I wouldn't have quite so many in the shop. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's... It's tricky business in some ways. I mean, if, if someone comes in and says, you know, have you got a book about birds, and you've only got one, there's no way they'll buy it. People like choice. They want, yeah. No, or a good point, yeah. So, so you learn so much on the show, Steve. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. So, and, you know, our, as a my little tagline is, you know, we aim to have a book about everything, and I do try, but it's no good just having one. So yeah, yeah, yeah. if you apply that, Literally, then yeah, that, that, that is the, the investment of stock gets colossal. That's right. Anyway, it's like ice cream. You got you, there's, you're looking at all the choices, yeah. and yeah, it's, it helps. Mm. I want to jump back across now into the fiction world and and actually talk about the spy espionage genre. Yep. And um, this crossed my desk: the Helsinki Affair by Anna Pitonak. Petoniak, I suppose. Yeah, Petoniak, I don't know. Yeah. That sounds... It just looks, looks like it's probably Polish. It looks like Anna, and it's got the, the cool red star. Yeah. Now, as I'm a paid-up member of the Red Star Masters and Table Tennis Club... <laughs> you I feel, I, I you had, feel you had to read that book. I felt like this was, you know, like me, because I, you know, I was always hoped that they would get one of these cool stars and you know, have a cool T-shirt with a big star on it, but hasn't happened. But they may be listening to the show and get the, get the message. But anyway... This is in a crowded, crowded field. Yes. When I when I visit Elmo's and look at the big spy genres, there's quite a lot of choice, and um, and also quite a lot of excellent. Pe candidates. There are a lot of people who are doing a very good job. With doing it, yeah. good work, yeah. and um, and I'm currently. Totally into the McHeron Slow House. Horses. Yeah, and yeah. I read Slow Houses and Oh Dead Lions, I think might have been the second mm. one. And waiting in book through, but I'm, I'm pacing them out throughout the year so I've got something really good every month. Mm. So um, and I watched the other day I was in a house that had Apple TV and watched the opening minutes of Slow Horses mm. to see what the characters look like. It looked terrifically sharp and... I understand it's a pretty good adaptation, yeah. Yeah, but it's just... It's but I don't have Apple TV, so... No, I don't have Apple TV, so... We'll have to wait till it turns up on one of the platforms I do have. No, no, what we do is we read the box. Well, that's We're right. We're readers, so mm. we go there first. But anyway, Hel the Helsinki affair, a couple of things off the back. If you're one of those people, we are not a few, who think they don't write thrillers like, thrillers like they used to, then... The Helsinki Affair is for you, an intricate, vigorously told and splendidly 
entertaining tale. Now, John Banville, mm -hmm. I mean, the sea and that yeah. John Banville yeah. is, is pumping it, giving it a tick. So immediately I thought, it's got the red star, John likes it, I'm mm. in. Mm. And so I went through it. Um, it is kind of not bad, but <laughs> that's, you know, damning it with faint praise. It is, um, it's got everything, it's got a history, you know, the, the, the character's father is in the CIA, she's in the CIA, she's, her, you know, head of the Rome Italian office and all that and all that, but discovering a sort of like, there's a history, a backstory about her dad, and, and it turns out that her dad is not what he seems, and um, and it, so it's going back and forth, and um, and it's got plenty of state of spy craft and all that sort of book. But um, as I say, the, it's 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 a good, competent book, and for someone who loves that stuff, they'll probably enjoy it. Um, it's not a. It's just. Something just it just didn't get over the edge for me, mm. which doesn't mean a lot of people won't like it. If you know, because it is, um, if you like CIA, you know, and the machinations that go, and in a nice, clever, interesting way. A lot of it, it doesn't matter how clever it is and how accurate it is. None of it really works unless you care a little bit about the people involved. You either have to hate them or worry about them or, you know. So a lot of it, those things come down to characterization. even. So I, I'm not saying that's not what's strong, but that, I'm surmising that may be yeah. the missing link. So it's, it's a competent book, and for someone who is um, attracted into the field, they won't be you know, terribly disappointed, but they, they'll be, they'll, and they'll, they'll have an entertaining read mm. um it's competent um just perhaps didn't catch me at the right mm. right stage often it's like the book i read before or what's on my mind whether i'm you know like enjoying that so it's often mm. the reader's headspace which is something we must talk about again now your final book well, how much time have we got where are we up to 921 okay. 421 okay so yeah. we we've got that and then we're really getting back into our your, question right well, well this is again a, Never sure. Of it. Oh, here we go. That way. No, that way. This Perfect. is called the Writer's Garden. This is the ultimate coffee table book for me, because it's about the gardens where writers wrote, and the houses that they lived in. And this is just a beautiful book. It's Seventy-five dollars, but I, you know, if this is what your thing is, and you, this is not going to work. But that's some snapshots from. Ernest Hemingway's garden at Key West. Um, is so is it, is it like two or three pages on each garden, or and a little story? A little story about a little process. essay. Yeah. The the illustrations look fantastic. The photographs are beautiful. So so all these places, I'm assuming, have been kind of preserved as you know, like Catherine Mansfield's house and stuff like that, and. Um, on um, this one, for instance, we had a look at this before. That's Thomas Hardy's house. Um, I mean, that, that is like straight out of like a kiss of the dip. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you go like. Yeah. So actually, he's writing about his house. Um, well, he's not, but <laughs> no. But well, yes, I suppose he was. And it, the, the 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 quick flicking through, I looking at that, it seemed like a lot of these writers were quite wealthy. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, they probably didn't start off living in these houses, but once they'd sold a few books. Um, so they made the, their wealth generated these. You yeah, know, sort of grew on you, on them a bit, and they were able to go and buy these. So uh, that's the secret for our listeners: is actually write a bestseller. Yeah, and then you can. So that's uh, anyway. This is William Faulkner's house. Um, picture of where Jack London used to live. Where um, this one's cool. Uh, that's, oh God, I never get this right. Here we go. Roald Dahl's house. Called Roald Dahl at Gypsy House. See, he had a writing shed, didn't he? That he he sort of went to, and nothing as grand as his house. But uh, yeah. I like the idea. He's you know one of those people that used to change their their chef every year. 
<laughs> the fact you know you have a chef that's yeah. quite... and that's that's the view from Agatha Christie's house oh god anyway um, I just think I'd be if, up if for the that. definition of a coffee table book is something where you can read little bits got beautiful photographs and it's really interesting and there's a certain but it was also when your friends are waiting for you to you know they're off well, you, your friend, you visit friends, and, yeah. and they're off making the coffee, yeah. and you've got to look at a book on their table, and then here you go. Yeah, there you go. This is Abbotsford, Walter Scott's house. Can't see that because that's a lot of books sold, but that's yeah. It's just I think it's a beautiful thing. Very good. Anyway, back to my question. Yes. Which books or writers have the most books being made to movie adaptations? I thought of three. Three came up. Philip Marlowe. Philip the Marlowe. Now Raymond Chandler. I realise Raymond Chandler, yeah. but were there like lots of those old Hollywood, you know, Maltese yeah. Falcon y yeah, yeah. LA Noir mm. type I, I, stories? I, I, I would have thought so. Don't know that for a fact. Yeah. Um Jane Austen. Jane Austen going um she would have that that would have been a lot of it has been made in the television yeah but i'm trying to think of, of movies some movies too yeah, yeah. okay agatha christie um, definitely look yeah. now now you've got onto my list okay agatha. some other two people didn't make your list no nah. and it went like this like they were it went john lacari's books were made into movies and yeah. it said like there was like 10 of them yeah and cause a lot of people here like one or two or yeah. three but to have even to get into double figures it's quite significant because to have that many books mm. um you know with the option picked up um john grisham has had you know like this got down here like at least 10 ian McEwan, like 11 of his books have been okay. made into films um nicholas spark who was a bit of a mystery to me well he sort of likes the note. kind of light romancy but, yeah type but apparently they, the america makes those they probably were never good enough to get a worldwide release but they were got they got made um ck rowling has had 11 movies jk like, rowling jk yeah i suppose eight, so. the eight harry potters and then other things well the um um the Galbraith ones, Robert Galbraith. Yeah. Well, they've been TV. They've been TV too. I can't think of anything apart from Harry Potter that's Ste made a movie. Ste oh, of course. The, well, there's the spin-offs, aren't there? The uh, Impossible Beasts and Where yeah, to Find yeah, yeah. Them. And that's how they're going. Yeah. Good one. Ian Fleming, 14, oh, I guess so. yeah. 14 movies. I yeah. mean, there's like 30-odd Bond movies, but yeah. 14 straight adaptations of his book. Yeah. Um, Agatha Christie. Now we jump into the big ones. Right. 50 movies. Crikey, okay. Um, and then we have um, Stephen King. Yeah. 50 plus movies. But the big winner, the big one, our mate Bill, William Shakespeare. 1,100 movies. Every country has made their own versions of of it and it is this from once movies were beginning began they just made rolled off movies that school market mind you but they kind of it yeah. just well it, it was a bit more than that when Laurence Olivier was in most of them he was he <laughs> was um but anyway that's our question for the for the week mm. uh, for the month um and good week Steve right in there with Agatha Christie but I missed the other eight <laughs> well, the other one, it really was, it was really the big three, mm. Stephen King, Agatha Christie and Shakespeare that were mm. kind of, um, and also, you know, I just saw this on the internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, with a, how good that is, of course, we really doubt things, you know, these days, but that was our, got us thinking. Well, that brings us to the end of the January episode and program of Book Lovers Why Rapper. It's um, thanks from Steve and I, and you can find this program on Elmo's Bookshop's face page, uh, Facebook page, and we look forward to catching up with you in February with another plethora, is that our word of the day? 
Yeah, concomitant, I thought was the word, but plethora is also good. You work on your vocab when you watch our program. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you in February. <laughs> Thanks, Gareth.